hello. Thank you all for coming. I'm Dinah Lenny. Um, I'm filling in for Peggy Shoemaker. She couldn't be here today, uh, but she very much wanted to be here. Um, and, and so I'm going to try to fill her shoes in a way that sort of becomes her. I'm going I'm to channel her as much as possible. Um, this is Inside Outside Blending Personal and Public Concerns in Nonfiction. And from what I gather, this is sort of in the air. Um, yesterday, I was on a panel with a wonderful writer um, and moderator, Margot Singer, and she said that she thought everybody was going to leave this conference wanting to write about the world. Um, you know, and yeah, right? Um, and, and I think that's much what, what the concerns are here today. Um, Peggy handpicked her panelists, of course, um, and she describes them this way, just so you know. One writer on this panel is a Palestinian exile who has family members in the Middle East. One writer blends Chile's horrific trauma and her own family's struggles. One writer's work brings alive women who followed Jesus, women who were silenced, women whose lives are left out of the official documents. One writer's essays focus on how music maps his father's life and his own, and what happens when his father, because of Alzheimer's disease, can no longer follow the score. Um, I was, you know, this is a, a, a topic that's close to my own heart, and I went back to a, a wonderful essay by Patricia Hampel, Memory and Imagination. Do, do any of you know this essay? Um, it's in a book called I Could Tell You Stories. And, in, uh, and I, I write memoir and personal essay. And in the book, uh, in the essay, Patricia Hampel says, true memoir is written in an attempt to find not only a self, but a world. And I thought that was appropriate to this. Um, so Peggy writes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from her description. Um, Peggy writes, when we juxtapose personal experiences and public events, the two perspectives bolster and enliven one another. When we deal at once with cultural concerns and personal reflection, our writing builds webs of connection. When our writing is fully in the present moment and fully involved with the complexities of the past and the possibilities of the future, our work is most likely to bear consequence in the lives of our readers. And she sent a brief paper of her own, which I'm going to read to you. And then I'll introduce the panelists one by one, and they'll each read. And then we'll have some Q&A and open it up to you. Um, but first, about Peggy. Peggy Shoemaker is the author of the lyric memoir, Just Breathe Normally. She won the Rasmussen Foundation's Distinguished Artist Award. Does anyone know if I pronounced that correctly, Rasmussen? Rasmussen? Thank you, Rasmussen. Thank you. So she won that award. It's going to be one of those days. Um, she's a professor emerita from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. She teaches in the Rainier Writing Workshop. And she writes, the finest nonfiction involves focused awareness of the workings of our inner lives. Simultaneously, it involves clear-sighted clear evocations of the wider world, tensions and synchronicities, our engagement with public events plus mindfulness of our most profound selves. That combination creates nuanced and moving writing that examines all our lives, public, the lives anyone who pays attention can witness, private, the lives we share with a trusted few, and inner, lives we sometimes don't even admit to ourselves. By the way, says Peggy, it's my personal view that truly moving writing needs to contain all those layered lives, and, and I agree with her. Um, in Just Breathe Normally, a lyrical memoir, this is Peggy writing, I evoke several historical events told from the point of view of the child who lived them. The assassination of John F. Kennedy, the moonwalk, the threat of nucle nuclear wa war, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Here's a brief sample. As a writer, I'm assuming that people will know about this era in history, but more and more readers and listeners were not born then and may need to hear that in the early 60s, America was on edge. We saw it in elementary school films about how to duck and cover under our desks and how to avoid radiation after a nuclear blast. Films that freaked me out because everybody ran into basements, which we didn't have in Arizona anywhere. <laughs> Here's a little slice of that time and place. And the piece is called Shelter. The big argument in the prosperous houses was this. Do we build a bomb shelter or a swimming pool? We weren't getting either one, so we didn't have that fight at home. <laughs> During the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had to take home notes. Our parents were supposed to write down who was allowed to pick us up if they couldn't get to the school. Worried, I said, why wouldn't you be able to come to the school? 
My mother snorted, then wrote on my note in her big loopy scrawl, you shouldn't lie to little kids. She made me take that note back to, back to school. When the principal called, the two of them had words. Then she packed us into the Chevy and took us to see the missile silos ringing Tucson. If a nuclear bomb hits, we'll all die together, she told us. Hardly reassuring, but I never suffered the delusion that nuclear war might create an inconvenience. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Peggy, and she is a wonderful writer. I, I urge you to acquaint yourselves with her work. She goes on to say, she, she's looking at this piece of, of her own writing, from this very condensed glimpse, you get a sense of the time and place, a sense of the characters involved, a fretful child trying to figure out how the world works, a mother who did not suffer fools at all, much less gladly, a principal trying to take care of kids the best she knew how in circumstances ridiculously beyond her control. My aims as a writer were to give a sense of the tensions within and beyond the characters, the school, the family, the society. When we juxtapose personal experiences and historical events that millions of people share, the two perspectives bolster and enliven one another. When we deal at once with cultural concerns and personal reflection, our writing builds webs of connection. When our writing lives fully in the present moment and is fully involved with the complexities of the past and the possibilities of the future, our work is most likely to bear consequence in the lives of our readers. I love that. And then Peggy says, and a personal note, thank you so much for coming to hear this panel. I wish so much I could be with you in Flagstaff, see you in two years at the next nonfiction now. <laughs> so that's from Peggy. Um, we're gonna go in this order, uh, Sherry, first Sherry, then Lauren, then Mark, and then Lena. So I'm gonna introduce Sherry first. Sherry Nanago Walker, how'd I do? <laughs> <laughs> Writes about place, environment, religion, and women's issues. Her work has been published in Women in World History and in Sustainability Publications. She holds an MA in Biblical Studies and is an MFA candidate in the Rainier Writing Workshop. And she's going to read to you now from her own work. Did we decide if this was on or not on? Okay, can you hear me? I don't have Dinah's gifts. <laughs> you have your own gifts. <laughs> First, I would like to thank uh, Peggy Shoemaker. She, uh, she's really the organizing spirit behind our panel, so thank you, Dinah, for stepping in. And thank you for being here and not at the Grand Canyon. It means a lot to us. <laughs> Halloween confession. I'm haunted by a woman named Joanna from the Gospel of Luke. In fact, I enrolled in an MFA program to put her ghost to rest with a finished thesis. In my first year, my mentor, Judith Kitchen, wrote me a letter. Dear Sherry, I'm going to do something I never do, but I think you would enjoy thinking about how I approach the unknown in the photographs in Half and Shade. Because Joanna is your unknown, I believe you'd have the kind of fun I had with the triangulation of self, object, and time or place. You have the same opportunity with the snippets of knowledge, how elusive they are, and how they spark larger thoughts. Joanna is sometimes just a person, Joanna, but sometimes she re represents other ideas, concepts. You can go for broke. Triangulation of self, object, and time or place. In her book, Judith looks at family photos and wants to insinuate herself into the, herself into the lives that are captured there. In the intro, she says, I wanted to ponder how each individual life was, is, framed by circumstance. How we sometimes are called to act and sometimes merely to reflect. Judith uses triangulation to explore what she can and cannot know. So triangulation is math. How we <laughs> measured the height of a pine tree at Girl Scout camp. <laughs> triangulation is dysfunction. <laughs> When a person won't communicate directly with you, but speaks instead through a third person. Triangulation is location, uh, GPS, which locates us. 21 satellites plus three extras orbit the Earth. For any point on Earth, four satellites are always positioned to derive a location coordinate. And voila, drones are sent to targets, or Facebook tells the world where we're drinking coffee. For Judith's assignment, I started with a postcard. In Israel, I saw a woman's portrait in a floor mosaic in Sepphoris, uh, which is a town in Galilee. We're low-tech here. <laughs> yeah. 
This woman's called the Mona Lisa of the Galilee. Her image gives me a face for Joanna. So how do I triangulate this? Lucky for me, Judith had just published a blueprint for this approach in an anthology called The Fire Edges of the Fourth Genre. Her article is called Gone is Sailing, A Voyage to the Edge of Nonfiction, in which I follow my own exercise for writing about a photograph. This guided my process in several essays, and especially one lyric essay that went a little wacky, and it's one of my favorite pieces. But why triangulate Joanna? In 1998, I spoke at a retreat about four women of the Bible. I'm trained as a biblical scholar, and I really look forward to this. And I prepared for talks about three of the Bible women uh, with tidings of great joy. But the fourth woman they requested, Joanna, was a problem. Joanna is a woman from the Gospel of Luke who appears in just two verses. In chapter 8, she is healed along with Mary Magdalene and other women. Joanna appears again in Luke 24 at the empty tomb. As I researched Joanna, I found little scholarship about her. This gap vexed me. Uh, surely by now we should know more about the women who were followers of Jesus. I sensed there was more to Joanna's story and that it was important, but I didn't know what it was. After the retreat, Joanna's story, or lack of story, festered like a splinter. Biblical studies is, uh, I don't know if you know this, it's actually an interdisciplinary field. Um, it raids other fields for anything that offers critical leverage on how to interpret the Bible. So fields like archaeology, history, linguistics, sociology, geography, literary criticism, comparative literature, although Bible scholars aren't so good at the last two. <laughs> I researched details of Joanna's story for context, for glints of insight, and this sent me on circles of hope, research, aggravation, writing, misery. I'd set Joanna aside, but a few months later, she'd haunt me again. I prefer writing that engages topics outside the self. In H is for Hawk, Helen McDonald shares her lifelong study of falconry. She buys a goshawk, grieves the loss of her father, and renders her compulsion with such exquisite language we can't help but follow. Self, hawk, sanity. In the paper garden, Molly Peacock explores the 18th century paper cut botanicals made by Mary Delaney. Triangulation, a woman from the 1700s speaks through a poet to us. Dinah Linney's book, <laughs> The Object Parade, auditions household items or heirlooms for associating, uh, association and memory Dinah says, certain objects, not always the ones we'd expect to keep or remember or dream about, insinuate themselves, take on a luster in which we are reflected, by which special effect we can somehow see, if not where we're going, where we were, and even why we are where we are. Parade essays spin off in intriguing directions with a compelling, authentic voice. This unique voice, Judith told me, invites a kind of intimacy even as it creates a more complex and difficult reading. So there's a fourth vex vector in this exercise of triangulation. Three GPS satellites can calculate a two-dimensional location, latitude and longitude, but the fourth satellite offers a 3D position, latitude, longitude, altitude. I often misread altitude as attitude. <laughs> Judith was always looking for new angles. She stretches us towards a fourth dimension of writing, and perhaps this curious dimension is voice or craft or attitude, or perhaps it's spirit, which I mean in a non-religious and a non-Halloween <laughs> sense. <laughs> Not just the intellect and perception of a writer engaged with a subject, but a unique human spirit that encounters something new and wrestles with that. In my own parade of objects, <laughs> I drafted a prose poem after wrestling with how little a Joanna's story is preserved in Luke's gospel. I'd like to read that for you. It's called Ossuary. This sacred book on my desk seems dry and bleached as a buffalo skull scraped clean with sun and wind. I study passages, parse Greek, shake sentences locked like wrought iron gates. I excavate thin white fur furrows between printed lines of text. I ask, pray, rant, rattle this book until the spine comes loose, hoping to shake something modern from something that's not. I'm a woman looking into a mirror of bone. In Israel, I saw ossuaries, bone boxes, 
The dead were placed in stone tombs. Later, bones were gathered into smaller boxes to make room for more dead. In Rome, I saw ancient marble sarcophagi scrubbed clean after their resurrections from catacombs. Ancients believed that lime content in the stone dissolved flesh, sarcophagus, from the Greek word sark, body, and phagain, eater, flesh eater. This white block of book on my desk swallows detail, text eater. It blanks what I seek, unlimes sinew and skin into plain paper, sparing only bones of stories, dry bones. I started this piece with simple triangulation, self, Joanna, place, insisting that the Bible tell me about Joanna. But this piece emerged as something different, triangulation. I gripe at the Bible through Joanna. <laughs> Eventually, I found vectors that lift Joanna out of her flat-paged ancient world. My Bible pirate raids into other fields yielded informational booty, but I'm careful <laughs> with Joanna's reconstruction. I'm a 21st century Christian woman writing about a first century Jewish woman. I recognize that distance and try to write an adequate bridge between my world and hers. Just as the discovery of Joanna required a multidisciplinary approach, so also the complexity of her reconstructed story requires a multi-genre approach, at least by my calculations. So I tell Joanna's story as a mosaic, tiles of memoir, travelogue, essay, short fiction scenes for what must be imagined, and poetry or prose poems when the research sets off lyric sparks. It took nearly 20 years, but I finally saw why Joanna is so important. Spoiler alert. Joanna and her women friends were far more dynamic, influential leaders than we realized. Women patrons shaped the early Jesus movement. The exercise of triangulation expands to include vectors of engagement with culture, our own and with others, self, subject, society. It turns out that triangulation is just the first meaningful step in what promises a sphere a galaxy of engagement. In the specific is the universal. The personal becomes the political. You'll have fun, Jesus says. You can go for broke. Thank you. That was great, Sherry. Thank you. OK, um, Lauren is next. Lauren Plickens lives in Seattle, Washington, where she teaches English to adult immigrants and refugees. She recently earned her MFA in the Rainier Writing Program at Pacific Lutheran University and is working on a nonfiction manuscript that examines memory, trauma, and relationships in the context of family and global histories. Come on up, Lauren. Can you hear me? Yeah? OK. I got a little stuffy last night, so. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Dinah, for agreeing to moderate this panel for us and for filling in for Peggy. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about my rationale for combining the personal and the public in nonfiction. And I'll discuss some strategies I use in crafting material. And then I'll read a short piece as an illustration. Because I'm obsessed with the work of Uruguayan writer Eduardo Galeano, I want to start by sharing a quote of his that has shaped my understanding of how I am and you all are connected to the past, to history. In the 80s, Galliano wrote a trilogy called Memory of Fire, which chronicles the history of the American continents from the pre-Columbian era to 1986. In the introduction to Genesis, the first book in the trilogy, he remarks, I did not want to write an objective work, neither wanted to nor could. There is nothing neutral about this historical narration. Unable to distance myself, I take sides. I confess it and am not sorry. What is told here has happened, although I tell it in my style and manner. This quote, the thinking behind it, became the impetus for my work during the last year of my MFA, and it has become the lodestar of my artistic philosophy since. And although I've written about its implications for crafting nonfiction, I've not entirely articulated how Galliano's stance 
has reshaped my personal and intellectual relationship with history. The quote I read implies a type of interaction with past events that I'd not encountered before. It is a style of interaction that suggests what I'd long, con what I'd long considered to be monolithic is actually permeable, flexible, and capricious. History, Galliano says, is always subject to interpretation. History, even and maybe especially what I was taught in school, is not immutable. I don't know about your teachers, but mine did not encourage me to interact with history on such brazen terms, which is unfortunate because history, if you only spend some time with it, is really a complex and fallible entity. Galliano's Book of Genesis begins with the American continents before they were claimed and settled. He starts with the myths of those who lived here first. These myths, the book's structure implies, are the authentic origins of American history. And because they explain what was happening in the present by crafting stories from a mythic past, they had an important function in indigenous societies. For the Kashinawa, Galliano shares, the sexual act was invented when the first man, the first woman and the first man tried to understand the curious discrepancies between male and female genitals. The first man, spying two monkeys mating in the arm of a tree, solves the mystery of the mismatched bodies and returns to the first woman, eager to educate her. <laughs> Galliano also tells of the Tarascans, who explain the evening star by remembering a night long ago when Moon asked her son to find his father. Not able to find him, the evening star is still hunting his father across the sky, but he always arrives too early or too late. By opening the trilogy with these stories, Galliano sets up a world in which contemporary issues and phenomena are explained by giving shape to a past. So why do I combine the personal and the public in my creative work? The word public, for me, refers to many things. Public bathrooms, the PBS specials I watched as a child, my public self, the me you see right now one small share of the whole. In my writing, I use the word public to talk about history. Stories shared among us, a collection of mutual excitements, grievances, and disappointments. There's nothing neutral about our historical narrative, to circle back to Galliano. What we call public hinges for me on what we share. Share, which is a word heavy with its history of meanings like shareholders, oversharing, and sharecroppers. But to share at its core also means to enjoy or suffer something with others, to divide one's own and give part to others, to hold or have jointly with others. What I'm trying to get at is a treatment of history that acknowledges our status as co-owners and stewards of a collective past and makes us unable to distance ourselves from the implications and reverberations of that shared story. Just as the indigenous myths fused the past to the present, combining our personal concerns with public history allows us to better grasp, direct, argue, and reckon with the intricacies of this moment in time. So very briefly, I'll share some strategies I've used in creating nonfiction writing that entwines the personal and the public. So after completing a certain amount of research, I begin a first draft by centering it around an image or character or scene that stood out to me. Um, Patricia Hampel, in the essay that <laughs> Dinah quoted, Memory and Imagination, um, she addresses this idea from the perspective of, of strictly memory-based research. Um, but she writes, we store in memory only images of value. The value may be lost over the passage of time, but that's the implacable judgment of feeling. This, we say somewhere within us, is something I'm hanging on to. This also applies to research. A professor of mine once said, notice what you're noticing, and that helps guide me as I wade through sources. Um, so after identifying that compelling item within the research, 
My goal is to manipulate it, to be biased and emotive as I write about it, in the hope of uncovering what meanings I can generate from it. Then I ask myself if there's another way to see it. And then is there a third or fourth way for me to approach and enter the research? It's often a trial and error type of situation. I've also found it useful to adopt the lens of someone directly connected to the subject. My creative thesis from the MFA examines dictatorship in Chile and more broadly, legacies of violence within social structures. Um, so write, in writing my thesis, the work felt most accurate and authentic when I channeled my emotions through those who experienced the subject firsthand. Um, so to finish, I'll read an example of that. Um, it's a short piece based on a scene from Chilean filmmaker Patricio Guzman's documentary called Nostalgia for the Light, which I highly recommend. So the piece is called The Women of the Search. In the driest earth of the Atacama Desert, a group of women search for someone disappeared. The desert minerals are magnets. The desert stars a compass. The sky is a blue cessation of ozone, and rocks speak history. But none of this helps the search of the women who no longer see anything but fragments of bone splintered from ankles, elbows, craniums, or feet. The whole world is this desert. The whole world, a body invisible. When Patricio Guzman meets the women of the desert, he asks, will you carry on searching? And always the answer is the same. If we must carry on searching, I will do so. The search for Pinochet's disappeared is a sentence handed down through time unending. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Already this overlap of strategy and, and focus, it's so interesting. Mark Rosema is the author of Road Trip from Boreal Books. His essays have recently appeared in Flyway, Weber Studies, Sport Literate, and Superstition Review. His writing explores how identity is shaped by relationships to landscape, community, and family. And Mark says he's happy to be among other nonfiction writers in his hometown of Flagstaff. <laughs> I feel like a, um, a game show host or something. <laughs> <laughs> Is that about right? OK. Um, I had a carefully prepared, written out statement. But you're going to get the real me, which is more like a ping pong ball in a wind tunnel. Uh, because my mind's been racing. I've been thinking of a new stuff. I was sitting over at Biss Bagels uh, fretting about the uh, upcoming panel eviscerating my comments. And I looked up at the wall and saw dogs on the wall, hundreds of portraits of beautiful, beloved dogs, each one particular, grieved over, remembered. And uh, I had several thoughts. One was, uh, you know, God, I miss my dogs up in Seattle right now. Uh, another was, I love my hometown. Um, and then, you know, as I was looking out the dogs, and uh, thinking there's something here about what I want to say at the panel. Um, it was a communal act of remembrance, but each dog was so particular, absolutely personal, brought together in a way that made a public statement. And walking from there to here, I thought of the mothers of the disappeared. I rem and that's happened in more than one country, but I was thinking of Argentina in particular, where the, you know, hundreds, thousands of mothers marching down the streets with portraits of their beloved ones, each one so particular, gone. And it was their way of saying, this person mattered, this person was an individual, this is deeply personal to me, but they came together and made it public, they made it political, they made it uh, universal. Um, and that helped me realize that I think what I want to talk about is community and how important that is in my work. And, uh, and I think of the inside-outside uh, metaphor. I think of an onion which has rings, 
and in the middle is me. And kind of narcissistic work would just stay in the me, and then some work doesn't get down to the me and just talks about, you know, ideologies and that sort of thing. But really powerful work is the whole onion, and it, it uh, moves back and forth between those layers. Um, I've been in Flagstaff all week. It's been a powerful and emotional experience. I grew up here. I have so many memories, so many friends. They're all so different. Uh, I struggle with the word political. In fact, I get paralyzed when I set out to write something political. All kinds of little voices paralyze me. One is, you don't do this as well as Wendell Berry or you know, whoever. Put in your favorite <laughs> author. Thing. Another is, who's going to listen to you anyway? Uh, <laughs> and then I write something political and I look back at it and I'm not satisfied because I feel like I'm just ranting or I feel like uh, someone else has said this better than me already. Uh, so I'm a lot more comfortable in the story realm. But when I write a successful story, I realize that I'm kind of bearing testimony or witness and that I have something to say. Uh, and I also realize that an imaginary audience I always have are all the crazy people I grew up with in this hometown. Uh, one of my best friends, deeply, deeply beloved friend of mine, uh, lives down now in the Verde Valley. We grew up together. We got in all kinds of trouble together. Well, he's a tea party guy now, and he loves his guns. He kind of fits that stereotype people have of Arizona. And I'm very progressive and, you know, I live in Seattle for crying out loud. <laughs> uh, you know, and then I've got other, and they're all over the map. And when I drive out to the res, like I did, you know, the last few days hiking, I see crosses on the side of the road. Those people are underground, and they were my friends too. And so I have this imaginary audience. It's all these people. Uh, there have been some shootings in Flagstaff lately. They made the news. Um, I'm thinking one couple back, a young police officer was shot here. And just before that, there was a lot of conflict going on on Facebook and with people I knew about, you know, police and, and Black Lives Matter and kind of people were taking sides and the, the culture wars are just raging. And then this guy was shot in my hometown and it changed the conversation because almost everybody I knew either knew him or knew somebody who knew him. Mm -hmm. And I had a dream that night, strange dream. The little church I grew up in here in Flagstaff, which is on the, I grew up on the east side of town in the 60s and 70s, that's the redneck side of town. It's not like all, you know, hipster like it is now. Um, <laughs> and so my church is very conservative, Republican, little church. Well, I had a dream that, uh, the members of Led Zeppelin were in town, <laughs> and they sort of sneakily informed me that they were planning a concert and a potluck in my home church, which is, I mean, dreams are weird. And, and my job was to get people together, and I got all the people together that I knew, and we had a potluck with Led Zeppelin playing in my church. Uh, and the, the, the metaphor of potluck, it's very important to me. I love a, this book called Potluck by Anna Maria Spagna. You should find it and read it. Really addresses how to build community, how to build bridges out of disparity, and how the key is taking care of one another even when you don't agree, even when there's pain, even when there's forgiveness and grace that needs to happen that allows that potluck to form. Uh, she influenced me a lot. Uh, I'm going to give some kudos to some people who helped me learn how to do this thing called writing, especially in regard to merging the, the personal and the political, or the personal and the public. Uh, Bill Kittredge was a huge influence for me. Uh, you know, he grew up in the West, in kind of the rural West, and knew how to talk about people that I understood. He has an essay called Owning, Owning It All, beautiful piece of work. Uh, in which he's talking, and the best part of it is when he tells a story about his crazy grandfather who was an old, old kind of mean style, old fashioned rancher, an empire builder. And uh, he takes his young grandson to uh, this enclosure where he captures magpies, and then he calmly, in a terrible way, with his icy stare, shoots all those magpies one by one. 
And his grandfather says, why? And the old man says, because they're mine. That's the most powerful part of that essay. It focuses on a particular man, but he's making a statement about a kind of a story that he doesn't want to believe in anymore. And then he moves on to talk about a, a different way of life, which is community. Um, some writers influence me who are not even literary or, or you know, wouldn't come up in a con uh, conference like this. Um, recently, I read a piece in ESPN.com by a sports writer. I'm a, kind of a sports nut, so uh, I read something called A Tormented Soul, and it's about the, con the crisis with brain damage and concussions in NFL athletes. And so he has an issue. He has a point he's trying to make, but he starts with this unforgettable, heart-wrenching portrait of uh, Mike Webster, an old football player, and the unraveling of his life because of early onset Alzheimer's brain damage, how it destroyed his marriage and his life, and how he was left alone to die a really miserable death. And the point is made through this beautiful, terrible uh, portrait of an individual. Um, read a great essay in uh, Pacific Standard called A Toast Story. Look it up if you can. Wonderful uh, piece about mental illness and community, but it's made powerful by the unforgettable portrait of a woman who owns a coffee shop in San Francisco. Starts out being about artisanal toast, which is like the ultimate sort of silly trend in San Francisco. <laughs> but then he finds out that what's behind this trend is this woman with an amazing story uh, of how, through her artisanal toast and coffee shop, she created a community to take care of her when she would go on psychotic episodes and would wander around town and wouldn't even know who she was or where she was going and how the community drew close around her. Um, when it comes to the outermost ring of the onion, if you, if you go from the me to the family to the community and you move on out, eventually you even get outside of the human race and get to animals. Uh, I, I've been touched by the work of Eva Salidas, uh, who writes about whales, and she writes about her personal relationship and connection to them. Jane Goodall, very famous writer, has a great piece called In the Forests of Gombe, where she gets away from the science and talks about personal relationship to the chimps and why it matters. Uh, those people were all inspirational to me. My own work kind of focuses on three things, which I think are all public acts. I, I tend to be better at the personal. I'm a storyteller, and the culture wars drive me crazy. I never know what to say. I get angry, and then I feel like I'm not doing any good. Uh, <laughs> but in my work, I do three things. Testimony, which in the old religious sense is a personal story intended to be told to a group to uplift. Uh, remembrance, really important. I, when I look back at my book, there's so many dead people in it, my God. But there are people that I want to remember publicly. And celebration, to name and claim those things that matter most to me. Um, and I don't know, how am I doing on time? I don't. Uh, do you have a little bit to read? I have a little us? bit to read. Why don't you read that to us? Okay. Please. This is about testimony. I left my MFA program uh, to go to seminary because I thought, why am I, you know, I should do something good for the world. I was confused. Um, and I took a long bike trip, 500 miles, uh, and uh, on that bike trip, I ran across a religious revival and I thought I should go. And I went, and it was. I was struck by the mean spirit of the revival. It was not what I expected. I expected, you know, to be, to be uplifted, and it didn't happen. So this is about religious confusion. All day long, I had wanted to attend the revival. It was as if my pedaling feet had been guided to this destination. But now, in an instant, I knew that I had to get out. This need was too visceral to be called a choice. It was more like a need to breathe, which is, literally, a need to be inspired. It took some physical effort to leave. It was like leaving a rock concert. I was in the front of the large crowd and had to aggressively shoulder my way past worshipers with their hands raised. On my way out, 
My eyes briefly connected with a woman. We exchanged no words, but her glance said to me, what's the matter, don't you want to praise the Lord? I'm sure my eyes gave the unequivocal answer, not yours. Sometimes confusion propels the journeys we must take. I had planned to sleep somewhere near Fairmont, but now I knew I would not be able to sleep. So I straddled my bike and began to pedal with a ferocity born of cognitive dissonance. The revival had left me wondering who I was, what I believed, and who my people were. Picturing the man whose testimony I had just heard, I thought to myself, Lord, whoever I am on my way to becoming, let it not be that. That night in West Virginia is a sharp-edged memory. The August air was muggy and thick. The road was blessedly empty of traffic, and I weaved crazily from side to side. Wind whipped through my hair, which I had then. Lightning shredded the horizon. Oblivious to time and fatigue, I moved through the landscape as a gathering wave moves through water. I didn't tire. Or perhaps it's more accurate to say that I did tire, but I pushed through it. I found more breath than I had ever found before. Many centuries ago, St. Benedict said, work is prayer. And that night, I poured my spirit into a prayer expressed not in words, but in work. I prayed with quads, quads glutes, hamstrings, and breath. I prayed with lactic acid. Surely I was moving, but toward what? Toward peace and joy, I hoped. Toward a certainty of things unseen, I hoped. Most of all, I hoped to be moving toward grace and freedom. It took some time, but at some point in the night, I quit thinking and began to feel free. A verse of scripture rose to the surface of my awareness and lingered till dawn. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. For a few blessed hours, anyway, it was true. I didn't trouble myself with questions. The bad taste of the revival faded and was replaced by the simple sensation of speed, the smells of summer night, and the fickle glow of fireflies in thickets along the road. There was no need to prove anything, understand anything, protest anything. Such moments are fleeting, as we all know. They are like faint stars that vanish when you look at them directly. Yet in, an, in another way, they stay with you forever. I'm tempted to say that the night didn't pass at all, that I'm still in it. But of course, in the usual, usual way that we measure change, which is to say, in time, it did pass. At sunrise, I arrived at the banks of the Ohio River with its old metallic surface, its inscrutable currents. I would cross that river into a new life and hoped that in that new life, the twin stars of grace and freedom would not be elusive. Alas, they did prove elusive. I met some truly good people at seminary, but increasingly I did not feel at home among them. After a year of banging my head against those sacred walls, I realized that I had not found my place after all, and it was time to get out once again. Sometimes we are moving, but not toward the destination we assume. I thought I was headed toward deeper assurance and certainty in my faith when actually I was moving away from it. As it turned out, the Ohio River was not my Jordan, and Michigan was not my promised land. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, our last reader today, and then we'll go into the Q&A, but let me introduce Lena Kalaf Tafaha. She writes poetry, essays, and translations. She's been twice nominated for the Pushcart Prize, most recently for her poem, Middle Village, which was, which was published by Ofi Press Mexico. Do I have that right? And you can find it online. Uh, her first collection of poems, Water and Salt, is forthcoming from Red Hen Press, and she lives in Redmond, Washington with her husband, and I found out just recently, three daughters. <laughs> three. It's just, just daughters here, but three. <laughs> Lena, come on. Okay, short person mic adjustment moment. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Um, today what I'd like to do uh, as a means of exploring the intersection between the personal and the public is to begin with a poem I wrote in July of 2014 and then I'd like to tell you the story of what has happened with this poem. <clears throat> Running orders. They call us now before they drop the bombs. The phone rings and someone who knows my first name calls and says in perfect Arabic, this is David. And in my stupor of sonic booms and glass-shattering symphonies still smashing around in my head, I think, do I know any Davids in Gaza? They call us now, 
to say run. You have 58 seconds from the end of this message. Your house is next. They think of it as some kind of wartime courtesy. It doesn't matter that there is nowhere to run to. It means nothing that the borders are closed and your papers are worthless and mark you only for a life sentence in this prison by the sea. And the alleyways are narrow and there are more human lives packed one against the other more than any other place on earth. Just run. We aren't trying to kill you. It doesn't matter that you can't call us back to tell us the people we claim to want aren't in your house. That there's no one here except you and your children who are cheering for Argentina sharing the last loaf of bread for this week, counting candles left in case the power goes out. It doesn't matter that you have children. You live in the wrong place, and now is your chance to run to nowhere. It doesn't matter that 58 seconds isn't long enough to find your wedding album, or your son's favorite blanket, or your daughter's almost completed college application, or your shoes, or to gather everyone in the house. It doesn't matter what you had planned. It doesn't matter who you are. Prove you're human. Prove you stand on two feet. Run. So that's the poem. Um, and to tell you the story of this poem, I have to talk about something that you've all been told is a political matter, a conflict, a dispute between two parties that are perceived as equals. Even when I tell you that I am Palestinian in this culture, I am being political. I need only recall the vocabulary that's reserved for people like me. Target, terrorist, even the word Israeli Arabs, which is used for some of my friends who are Palestinian natives of cities like Nazareth and Haifa. Or, um, because it's Halloween, the claim that Newt Gingrich made in October of 2012 um, in the election cycle there is no such thing as a Palestinian people. Now, to be fair to Newt, he's not the only one who's made that claim, but my daughter's reaction when they heard this was to burst out laughing hysterically and say, we're ghosts, and run around chasing each other going, boo. <laughs> and while it may be laughable or absurd, and it is, I view these statements and their cumulative effect as a form of violence. The violence of denial often lays the foundation for actual physical violence. I think of Netanyahu's comment during the War of 2014 in response to images of the dismembered and rotting bodies of Palestinians strewn across the street of Gaza cities. He said, the Palestinians want these telegenic deaths. What I think about now in terms of writing this poem is that I probably wrote it as a moment of change in me. Um, before, I had always been trying to explain when I would write to my elected officials, to newspaper editors, to non-Palestinian fellow humans, but really no explanation is needed. The great equalizers of our time, social media and cell phone videos, make the imagery and sounds of what is happening available to everyone, and they go head to head with the surrealism of American news coverage. So what is left to say then? If an open-air prison of 1.8 million people, 80% of whom are refugees, 40% of whom are children, most of whom are profoundly malnourished, who have been besieged for nearly 10 years, if all of this cannot speak for itself, then what is needed? And I think about the Adrian Rich quote, the moment of change is the only poem. And in me a change, I think, was happening that July the understanding that what is needed is something akin to the articulate rage that Maggie Nelson described in her keynote. Something transgressive needed to be said. Um, and maybe what was needed is an intimate essay, as Barry Jean Borich described in her um, panel on the Poesetics of Form, a writing from the inside out of experience. So once I wrote this poem, I just posted it on my Facebook page, which is a private page for my friends and family. I, didn't, I just wanted it like outside of myself. But the poem had other plans. Um, I began to receive messages saying things like, Lena, are you on Twitter because your poem is? And um, there is a guy who translated your poem into Hebrew and tweeted it out. Did he contact you? Because it's a really good translation. My poem became multilingual. My poem got a passport. Soon the poem that scorched through me was traveling the world. 
Over the next two weeks, I learned that it had been translated into Spanish and printed in a newspaper in Bolivia, shared by the Irish Workers' Party Facebook page, and recited in English at a solidarity rally in Tokyo. A British woman stood in a London subway and read my poem out loud as an act of protest to commuters. The poem disrupts. You can imagine my shock as the summer burned on to find on the Massachusetts Review blog my name and the title of my poem in the middle of an article about a conference entitled Literary Responses to Genocide in the Post-Holocaust Era. <laughs> the blogger, someone I have never met, was Jim Hicks, editor of the Massachusetts Review, and he said the following, and I'll just read you a, a brief excerpt from his blog post. Um, in her Fruits of Sorrow, Vicki Spellman gives an eloquent reading of the former slave Harriet Brent Jacobs' memoir, and also offers a strong argument for the power of literature. For Spellman, great writing like that of Jacobs teaches compassion, fine-tuning the non-sufferer's responses. There are many things that could and should be said about Lina Khalaf Tufaha's running orders, a poem that has burned through cyberspace in the past few weeks. At the very least, we must acknowledge its power in precisely Spellman's terms. The intimacy of address in this poem is simply excruciating. When I introduced the poem during our workshop discussions at the Holocaust Museum, we didn't get very far into it, but a whispered comment from the colleague to my left did prompt yet another working title for this blog post. Nice try, she said. My poem tries to imagine what never again can mean. My poem lives on in Italian, in Norwegian. I have never met nor been contacted by a single one of its translators. They feel the poem is their moment and are compelled to make it accessible to others. A friend sends me a link she has found to a YouTube video. A young African-American woman named Sojourner and her mother, grandmother, and aunts sit in a circle. Sojourner says in the video that she has made it as an act of solidarity with Palestinians. In the circle, she's holding a piece of paper. She begins to read my poem. She passes it to her mother, who reads a few lines, and her mother in turn passes it to her aunt, and so on. The poem becomes a prayer. The poem builds community. After a ceasefire is finally reached in Gaza, we are left with a landscape transformed, entire families eviscerated, neighborhoods that no longer exist, thousands of children and adults with spirits and bodies irreparably broken, and still before us the necessary and impossible task of witness. A woman named Joanne writes from New Mexico, I hope you don't mind I figured out your mailing address. <laughs> I had to send you this. I put your poem to music. There is music in what you've written. There's not much I can do, but I am Jewish and I believe in peace and I can do this. The poem begins to sing. And I'll just leave you with this closing uh, image. Last Sunday, I woke up at 6.30 a.m. because in Gaza, it was already late afternoon. A room full of teenagers are gathered, girls and boys from the English Writing Club at the Qatan Center for Children. We're gonna chat on Skype. My job is to talk to them about poetry and the writing life. Maryam, who's 12 years old, tells me she loves haikus so much she's trying to learn Japanese. <laughs> Muhammad asks me who my favorite poets are. He doesn't want two names, he wants more details. Uh, Mira wants to know how to improve her creative writing skills but confides she really hates to read. The room is electric, the children are bright lights. A boy who has had his hand up for a while finally gets a turn to speak. My name is Khalid. I am 14 years old. I performed your poem, Running Orders, here in Gaza. The poem breaks a siege. definitely can't, um, I mean, can you, panelists, can you, can you set out to write something that will go viral? No. Here, I want to, um, I want to put this here. Um, th so that's an incredible story. That, you guys can hear me, so I don't need that mic. And if they do, they'll, they'll speak into it. Yes. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of time because I'm sure you have questions. You do, right? Yes. Um, so I, I just want to say, um, I want you to each talk. So 
when you begin this kind of writing, the writing that you're doing, this I, I looked up three words last night on Wiki. Actually, this is Merriam-Webster. I looked up political, of or relating to government, a government or the conduct of government, of relating to or concerned with the making as distinguished from the administration of governmental policy. So that was one definition. Then I looked up public, exposed to general view, open, well-known, prominent, perceptible, material. And then I looked up personal, just for the hell of it. Oh, public is also of or relating to people in general, universal. Personal, of relating or affecting a particular person, private individual, done in, per, in person without the intervention of another, carried on between individuals directly. So, I mean, the interesting thing is the kind of um, triangulation and also the, the division of, you know, doing this work very, very privately in, in, um, in you know, in, by ourselves and then putting it out in the world and letting it go. I wonder um, if any of you have had, so with all that response, for instance, Lena, to the poem, was there any response to it that rattled you beyond the kind of, beyond the, the huge response that you got? Was there any moment at which you thought, wait, that's not what I meant? Oh, yeah. Can you talk about that? Can mm -hmm. you talk about releasing this work into the world and having it perhaps misinterpreted? Sure. I mean. Um, that summer was my first residency at uh, the Rainier Writing Workshop at PLU, and so, you know, so much for being just an anonymous regular student. Um, <laughs> and the director of our program asked if he could post the poem on the university's website, and I said, sure, you know. And <laughs> there were some comments that were like having this political debate with the poem, with the poem. Like, think <laughs> about that. When you create a work of art, and someone says in response, why doesn't the poem talk about Syria and Darfur and all the other places where they're suffering? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, maybe other poems should also be written about Syria. <laughs> it was just, was, you know, it's fascinating to me the kind of, um, the, the way people want to have those sorts of arguments with a work of art. And so it makes me think about the privilege of not being political, like that some people have that privilege and I am not one of those people. And you know how one gets such a privilege, so right. And yet, people are using the poem absolutely using it politically, which yeah. is really interesting. Um, I loved what you said, Lauren, about Galliano and this idea that that uh, I you know I take history personally. I take these things personally. Um, do you feel any responsibility in the writing to? to skew that in a different direction? Do you feel a, 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 any of you, do you feel a responsibility to bring in a, a, a yeah, the people in Darfur will have to write their, you, I often say to, to people in my family, you know, you'll have to write your own book. You know, <laughs> this was my memoir, you'll have to write your own book. <laughs> but, so how many of you feel a, a, um, at, in the writing, in the personal in space where you're first creating the work, how many of you are aware of responsibility? Talk about it, Sherry. Um, I, I'm writing about a dead woman in, in an antique book, an ancient book. Uh, but uh, the, the work that I do has ramifications far outside of my obsession, which is what it is. It's an obsession. Uh, I was um, asked to speak in three or four years ago in Uganda at a pastor training conference. And 500 pastors and their wives came from seven African countries. And I was working with the women and, and uh, with my friend and colleague, Rose Mugabe. And Rose says, in Africa, women are beasts of burden. That's how she starts her talk. You know, so I begin sharing about what I found, what I've learned. And as I heard the women's stories, I realized that the Bible is being interpreted very literally in the churches these people are part of. And that means women are always relegated a second position, a second role. But more than that, this literal interpretation of the Bible is replacing traditional African culture as a way to validate oppression of women, and especially women in poverty, okay? So that kind of sets me off. <laughs> yeah. And so as I work at this, um, I kind of have to walk this careful line. I need to write my story, my engagement, what am I called to, to write about? But aware that there's this whole world out there. There are millions of Christian women around the world who are impacted by these kinds of issues. I think it's really important that we get this picture more accurate, as accurate as it can be, of, of women in the first century church. 
you know, from a Christian perspective. Right, right. So yeah, there's like this, always this thing behind me, <laughs> you know, and I try not to think about it, not as even the editor, but just there is this kind of ghost behind me. I can't pay attention to that. And I don't know yet if I'm fully successful. I haven't finished the final book. Mm -hmm. But I'm always aware of that. Okay. But there's always something outside, you know. I, for me, I think it depends on what, and when I'm writing each piece, what lens I have on. Because I think when I read a piece, you know, like the one I read, where I'm really trying to get inside somebody else's perspective and just come from a really, just a place of deep, deep empathy. Um, and so I, I kind of, and so, especially in that first draft, you know, I'm trying not to think so much about that and go back and do it later. But in, in that first go, I'm trying to just so much embody this person and their experience. And even if it's not some, you know, if it's not, I have never had a family member who has been, you know, who was part of the um, dictatorship in Chile who suffered the consequences of that. But to connect that grief with something of my own and just to, to embody that. But then I think there's a different there's a different tra type of work that you're doing where I am trying to put my my perspective into the research, um, which is a different type of piece, um, but it's where I'm more wearing the lens as an outsider, as a researcher, and who's trying to get across how I'm processing this material. Um, so I think I want to just make a distinction between work that is strictly trying to embody the research, to put forth what I found in the research versus a piece where I'm in it, right? Where, right. where the, the pronoun I is, is me and I'm sort of processing and performing the sort of the comprehension of that material. And it's um, really interesting, you also talked about the ways in which history is flawed, what, mm -hmm. you know, that we're looking, that history is, um, is sort of a record of, of what we haven't forgotten, and as we know, we forget most of everything, so, you know, that, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, Mark, what about you? I, I feel you, you know, your, your writing is so, um, and your, your sort of sense of yourself as a writer, it felt to me, is fi it's very generous, this idea of, of building community and, and making community. Do you, do, you, are, do you have a reader in mind as you're crafting this stuff? Do you have a, a, an ideal reader? Well, for this book, it was all the people I grew up with here in Flagstaff. Right. Uh, you said and that. so I'm speaking to some dead people <laughs> yeah, and, some, absolutely. and some living people. And, uh, you know, it may be different for, for, the, for the next book. Um, I was a little, I was honored and a little perplexed to be invited to be on the panel because I, the, the writing I've done so far is a lot more personal than, it's not overtly political. And that's partly because I'm not great at, I have on my computer all these essays about immigration and uh, land use policy and things that make me mad. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they kind of suck. So that's why they're not, uh, you know, I don't know how to do it yet. I'm still learning. I want to write more political stuff than I've done so far, but I want to do it well. So that's so interesting. I want to read you something. I'm, I'm looking at an excerpt here from an interview that was in a publication that's very close to my own heart, the Los Angeles Review of Books. Um, I read this interview. I, it posted on October 19th, and it's called um, Unfictional Geographies. So I feel it's, it's fair game here today, even though it's uh, an interview between two fiction writers. Um, Alex Espinoza is in conversation with Janine Capo Cruce, and at one point Alex asked Janine, do you view yourself as a political writer? If not, why? If so, what responsibility does the political writer have to her community? And Janine answers, no? I say no with a question mark because I'm not really thinking about politics when I write or revise, and I don't have any specific agenda I'm trying to communicate through my fiction but I obviously realize my writing has political implications. And really, couldn't we argue that all writing is in some way political? What do you think about that? I want to jump on that because I think I was invited by Peggy to be on this panel because of the pieces in here that are about Alzheimer's disease and uh, my father, my father-in-law, and, and some other people. And those are like among the most personal uh, works in there. But, uh, you know, a good friend of mine, Holly Hughes, who lives up in Seattle, has, has put together a beautiful anthology, poetry and prose, uh, for, regarding Alzheimer's disease. 
And when I first found that book, I opened it up and I read a short piece and I burst into tears about someone's story that I had never met. And uh, so once again, you know, that personal can explode into right. the public sphere in a way that's very powerful. And the implications sometimes are subtly in the essay, and I would like to, in the future, make them less subtle and more overt, but you know, one of those implications is we need to take care of these people. So that's a statement about health care. That's right. a statement about budgets and priorities. But uh, it's your personal story that makes it real. It's that, that yeah. thing of the more personal something is, the more, I think you're all saying this, the more likely it is to touch the universal nerve. Lena, did you want to, and after you guys, t I should, I, I'm, I'm scared that I'm not going to have time for them, so and jump in, really jump in fast. and answer. I'll yeah. just say Don't that, be fast. Uh, <laughs> I'll just say that political is this complicated label that I, I think that the external puts on the writer. I'm not sure what to call it, so I'm just going to say external. Um, people, when we, when we write about things that end up being discussed politically, we're writing for our very lives. Think about arguments over gun control. Think about, you know, arguments over choice and different ways that people see uh, women's choice. All of these things are about pretty much life and death. Um, and <laughs> that's a shared human experience. Um, and the stakes are very high. And so I think I, I struggle with the term political because it's a way to sort of um, suggest that something isn't really you know, writing or a creative act. And, and I'm, I'm a little resistant to that. Um, I think about someone like Edward Said, who's a touchstone for me, one of the greatest thinkers of our time, someone who was very highly accomplished in his own field and could have just stayed with that, but decided that to write from a profoundly personal place of deep loss about being a Palestinian was so important and simply could not be avoided. Um, and about that seminal essay or article he wrote when he went back to Jerusalem in the early 90s and stood in front of his family home in West Jerusalem and was not allowed in by the people currently living in it who believe the home to be theirs. Is it political? I don't know. To me, that's a man who can't go home. Um, and so that term political is wielded like a weapon a lot, and I, I'm, a, I'm a little resistant to that. Although it, it's interesting, it, it, as soon as something's political, it is personal, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you have questions, you guys? Yes, way back there. Speak up, please. Thank you very much, Lena. Especially since yesterday, President Obama decided to defend U.S. military in Syria. Based on a lie in that the sarin gassing of Syrians was not President Bashir, but Putin, who gave the excuse to do that to get in to the airstrike. And I have a question. She would want me to say that the current destruction by the U.S. government parallels ISIS. Why is war, the longest war in U.S. history, not yet personal so we can write about it? Well, I think that's a great question. Does anybody have an answer to that question? Anybody here want to approach the answering that question? I mean, I, you know, what we. I, I, I'm, you know, Americans are solipsists, like, you know, you know, we're sort of in our navels. But anybody want to touch that? I think something you said a little bit ago is um, history that, that we forget most of it. And we were talking at dinner last night how that's so not true for, for other countries and other cultures. And I, and I wonder if that has something to do with it. That's just a uniquely American thing, right, that we're – that the, that war um, in recent history that we want so badly to always move on from something and that we never look back, um, which I think is a really dangerous way to live. 
Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer. But well, I don't. You know, I, I'm not sure there is an answer. Yes. No, I just wanted to respond to that comment. I think it's really interesting one about like American families or ethnic families like a really important topic. Mm -hmm. and Can everyone say, hear? Good. Yeah. So just in in like as a counterpoint to what to what you said about how white Americans choose to forget, um, I think it's also important to remember what Americans choose to remember. Like no, like my son is eight, um, was born in Canada, and he knows about. And having to do with the oceans on all sides of us, having to do with the well, not all sides. We share border with you. Right, that's right, <laughs> right, right. But the dis but the destruction, the destruction that we cause yes. over there is destruction that we can easily and, and, and you know. And but then we have Katrina, you know. Yes, no, exactly. And so there are things that. So I think there's. I think it's. I think it's more complicated than a sort of blanket amnesia. I think it's selective amnesia. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah. Absolutely. I think some of it is also just, you know, what you're permitted to see. I mean, I forget the exact yes. story, but, you know, during the earlier part of the war in Iraq, I can't even keep track anymore, you know, there were these journalists who would take photographs of American servicemen who had been killed, you know, their coffin draped in a flag, and American newspapers stopped publishing those images. Right. The war with no cost, the well, war with no blood. On, on words from Right, and so, you know, I grew up in um, third world countries that are not democracies, and it blows my mind that we can live in a place that is a democracy, and, and you can have a situation like that. And, and so you, the information we get, the facts that we have access to are curated, and they're curated by self-interested parties. And it's important to keep that present all the time. It's exhausting, but it's important. And I think also this might, in, in sort of, trying to wrap my mind around that question of yours, this might also sort of go to Lena's um, kind of trying to parse the, the difference between explaining and explaining versus an act of transgression in the writing, whatever that means to you. The idea that, um, that maybe so much, you know, if we can get past kind of the laying the foundation and the background and explaining and being, and jump into the particular situation then we would do a better job of reaching readers and audience. But again, the devastation is an ocean away, and, the, and, and who's going to do this writing? Who's going to do it? Are there other questions? Yes. Yes, but I haven't quite figured out how to phrase it yet. <laughs> um, Try. OK. <laughs> so um, I once met this American writer who wrote a play about Israel in which there were no Israeli characters. Everyone was American. Um, <laughs> and he, but his agenda was to be entirely political in that he wanted to understand this place, but he was, and this is me putting my interpretation on it, he was so hindered by his only trying to be political that it was entirely personal, in that he didn't access the Israelis at all. And when someone commented on this, he put Israelis in there and they had New York accents and slang. Um, I guess my question is something like, to what extent is it uh, appropriate or okay, or do we have a right to attempt to engage with situations with which we have no on-the-ground understanding of that argument? What is a that great like, question. Yeah. Do, are we allowed to use our imagination just because we care? or? Yeah. Talk about that then. <laughs> Talk about the role of imagination versus research and how you parse that. That's a great question. Could, could I take a stab at that? Do. Because I, I think it's, I think what I'm hearing in our extended discussion here is the power of the personal voice. You know, something, an issue, an event, you know, a culture, whatever that is, filtered through a, a person's sensibility. That's the kind of writing I most like to read. And I think you know there is this idea of colonization and appropriation of cultures, and I think we need to be really mindful and aware of that. At the same time, I think it's valid for someone to have meaningful engagement within an event or culture that they might not have experienced firsthand. You just have to do a lot more work. Yeah, okay, you know, I'm not in Judea and Rome in the first century, but I'm still compelled to tell my story as I try to figure that out. And Lauren is, you know, you were not in Chile or have family members at that time, but you're engaged with that. And then we have something that's so directly related. And to me, that power of that personal voice, 
really makes a difference. We just need to be really self-aware and and really um, genuinely interested in the thing outside yourself. I think. Um, last I question. Just did an of yes, that. please. Um, I think that also um, that's important, but it's also allowing, <coughs> allowing those voices, such as you're like, who's going to write about the experience of Syria, but who's going to write about the black experience in America? If we don't, I mean, if you look at the crowd here, and the voices. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a a great so note. It's a big, huge question, and I and and you know it's interesting. I was talking with somebody about was it with you guys about Tanahisi's Coates's mm -hmm. book and, and and this you know this book that's sort of um, he's such a popular uh, and critically acclaimed, popularly acclaimed writer, and here he's put this new book out there and said to us in this book, "This isn't for you. This is not for you." And yet, you know, we've embraced this. So it's a very interesting dynamic. Um, Thank you all so much for coming today. And uh, I'm sorry Peggy wasn't here, but she would be so gratified if she knew what an engaged audience you are. Thanks. Thank you.